Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, March 17. I believe it is St. Patrick's Day today. I'm glad you're all here and um, happy St. Patrick's Day, especially if you're Irish. Uh, St. Patrick's Day was that day in school where I always made sure to wear a green shirt because I didn't want to get pinched. And then there were those kids who would only, um, uh, would, oh, sorry, something just weird happened with my computer. Um, who would only wear, uh, <laughs> sorry y'all, I'm having a little technical difficulty here. Hang on, hang on. My program is being weird. Um, okay, I got it. We're back. Um, the kids who would wear green underwear, right? And then you would pinch them and they would get you back because they were wearing green. Um, hopefully this is working. Someone will let me know if it is not. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but it looks like maybe, maybe it is. I'm having a, yeah, hang on. I put that down there. Um, okay, the joys of technology. Um, yeah, anyway, happy, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, before I forget, I think I will be back on March 31st. There are three Wednesdays in March this year, which is the last day of March, and almost exactly one year since we started Change the Shed. So, those of you who have been watching for a year, congratulations. I didn't think we would be here a year later, but um, here we are. So, um, and I'm happy for it. I've had a really fun time um, doing Change the Shed. I think we've done 54 episodes or something now. So, um, yeah, so some of you have sun and clover and four-leaf clover, and some of us have many feet of snow outside. So uh, we got dumped on this week. I actually um, still can't get my car out of the garage, so it doesn't really matter. We're not going anywhere anyway. So I have been weaving samples um, lately, lots of samples for many things. Um, Samples for the tapestry behind me, which I have now actually, hang on, this big um, cartoon hanging on that loom. I have done some redesigning after um, consulting with an artist friend and um, deep thoughts. Um, not a major redesign, but I will have to redo that cartoon. So, <clears throat> more delay, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. In the meantime, I'm sampling. I've got, let me show you, hang on, sorry about that. Uh, these are color samples for that tapestry. So I wove these at some point when it was snowing last weekend, probably, and um, was working on, let's see if I can zoom in, was working on, um, looking at some lines. There's some um, major dividing lines in this piece, so I was playing with different ways to do that. This is a variegated yarn I dyed and some solid blacks out of Weaver's Bazaar. I kind of like the Weaver's Bazaar blacks because the wool it looks so different than the Harrisville yarn that I'm using. So that's something I'm considering using largely because it, um, it has a different look and it also is much flatter than the Harrisville. And so I don't, um, considering doing that. And this is the other colorway, which has a few errors in dyeing, which I knew before I was, um, before I used it. But this color down here is, um, somehow I didn't get enough black in it. It is not, uh, quite right. You can see here between this color and this color, this one is a lot brighter. So that was a dyer, and if I use this, I'll have to redo that color. And then I screwed up the color between these two. There was one more in here. Color number five. Um, so color number five will need to be um, redone if, I'm, if I decide to use these. But I like this colorway a lot. Um, anyway, this is one of the samples I've been doing, and... Um, 
I haven't cut these off. I normally would have just cut these off so I could start using them, but I um, have a lot more warp on here and I have another thing I need to sample. So I'm gonna roll them around and uh, use the rest of some more of this warp before I cut them off. I did them like this on separate um, warps because um, for one reason, I wanted to be able to move them around and compare colors. So if they're on separate warps, I can look at them side by side and see um, whether the colors, where they actually meet in the cartoon are going to interact with each other or if I like them. Um, whereas if I had done them all on one sample, which I often do it that way also, um, like here's a sample where I did um, a bunch of different colors on the same um, thing, uh, it's harder to look at what you're doing in terms of what goes next to each other. Anyway, there's that sample. And um, the other sample, actually I'm working on a couple other ones, but these are the two I brought out today. Uh, this one, let's see. This one I'll actually weave on a little bit. This is a simultaneous contrast sample for the design solutions class. So if you're in that class, you're gonna see this. Um, you're gonna see this uh, come up pretty soon in April. I'm weaving this one from the back. I wove the other one from the front because I was gonna take pictures of it. This one I'm weaving from the back and I actually set up my Mirax treadle so I could weave this faster. Um, it's got, let's see, here's the back. So what I'm looking at is um, a simultaneous contrast thing between a solid color and colors that we would use for weft bundling. Not sure why that's not focusing. That's better. So in this sample, I'm mixing um, a yellow green and a red orange, and I'm trying it with a violet. This is not a, as saturated a color, so I wanted one example that wasn't as fully saturated as some of the other ones. Um, what was I doing here? It looks like I was gonna keep doing this, but I'm not going. And this here. So this um, simultaneous contrast is the color theory. It's my favorite color theory thing where you um, every color influences every other color. And so it's a gas to play with it. So much fun. Um, these two colors are, um, they're also complements, and so they're going to um, influence each other that way. But as soon as I started mixing these, I was like, whoa, that green has completely changed colors. And it's super fun. I'm not sure I would ever actually use these colors in a tapestry, but sometimes an extreme example is needed for teaching. Um, let me just check in on you all. Maryland, hi everybody. Hi Barbara from Bainbridge and Nita from the UK. And I know I missed all of your other hellos, but um, I do actually look at the chat later. So I know there are sometimes things I miss, but I do go back and look at it um, when we're all done. Hi, Leslie in Vermont, where apparently it's sunny and it's raining in Kansas, and Paula from the UK, and Greece, and Kathleen. Kathleen, I can always count on you to ask good questions. She wanted to know if I finished the hand basket piece. So I was hoping to just sort of slide that by and not, you know. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't finished the hand basket piece. It is behind me on the floor. Um, and as I was talking, those of you who are astute will notice that I 
did this in a way I do not want to do it. I put both of these in the same direction. So I will revisit that. Actually going to put a pigtail here. So in this shed, this one is going that way. I want this one to go this way. I sometimes don't bother putting the treadle on the Mirax, but um, oh my gosh, if I'm weaving samples, like this is the simplest weaving on the planet and the treadle speeds it up amazingly. Plus it saves my shoulder. Okay. Oops. And when I make mistakes like that, I can fix it faster. So I'm doing a little dovetail thing. It's not really a dovetail. I'm doing alternating loops around this one warp. I guess it's sort of a dovetail. I'm trading off which yarn is going around this warp. So that is a dovetail, but it's not, um, they're not locking every time. Warp interlock. Um, so yeah, Laura, warp it's kind of a warp interlock. It's not, um, I'm, I'm moving, um, the green over once. So every other time it'll just shift back and forth one warp like this. You'll see. Um, so top of the morning, <laughs> St. Patrick's day y'all. Um, you know what? The one thing I didn't do was my split weft interlock. I'll never go back after this. I'm going to take this out and go back and put it in because I want it to look the same. I want to use this sample for many years and I don't, um, I want it to be right. Okay, so split weft interlock. I'm going to use one of these. And I need a piece of this one. So Kath Michelle asked what, um, oh, hold the phone. Gosh, it was a good thing I did that. So these are in the wrong, uh, it is even on the very simplest thing. Um, can be tricky to talk and weave at the same time. I have screwed it up, most certainly. Um, it's a good thing I went back. These were not in the same sheds. Okay, so let's see if, see if they are now. Um, when I check it, I want to make sure that this and this is in the same shed, which it now is. And okay. Let's see if I can get that to stay focused. Okay, so for a split weft interlock, I now want, I'm moving. In the same shed, I'm going to put this one all the way across. Okay. So there's my split weft. And now let's look at our sheds. We have, this one is in the other shed and this is in this shed. This was one ahead. So let me just, we'll look at it like this. So I want the heads of the butterflies to meet in the same shed. So the same shed is open, ready to weave. Nope. You guys, I don't know what it is about St. Patrick's Day, but I made like 40 mistakes in all of, how many minutes have we been on? Less than 15 minutes. Woohoo! Okay. This one goes this way in this shed. This one goes this way in this shed. If we get this right and I don't have to take it off out after this broadcast, it'll be a freaking miracle. It'll be the luck of the Irish. Okay, but now I got my split weft interlock in there 
and I can start weaving this very plain thing once I get it going correctly. I will answer Michelle's question about simultaneous contrast. <laughs> Leona's cutting the grass in British Columbia. Um, I'm not sorry about the snow. We need the moisture. We're in a massive drought and have been for a decade now. So the snow is good as long as we don't end up with a flood this week. But we got a couple feet of snow, which is a lot for this town. And um, we're still snowed in. I can't uh, get either car out at the moment. Fortunately, don't have anywhere to go. Okay, I think we're on track. Things are moving in opposition. We got meet and separate. We've got our very odd uh, simultaneous contrast thing going. The treadle's working. Maybe the luck of the Irish is coming my way. Um, so, yes, Paula, um, checking the shed by putting your hand in is a really, I do it all the time. Um, well, I don't always put my hand in it, but it's a good way. If you're not used to looking carefully at the shed, it's a good way to see. So I can see when I do that, that this is ready to weave and this is ready to weave. So I know everything is in the same shed. Um, not that everything would always be in the same shed. If you're building shapes, it won't be, but um, you can figure out where you need to be by looking carefully. And when you're weaving in a line like this, with an interlock that everything needs to be weaving at once. It's good to it's good to check and make sure things are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. This seems to be one of those days, so if you see me screwing it up, let me know. I think from here on out we're going to be good for about two and a half inches. So simultaneous contrast is a color theory principle. It's my favorite one. And I talk about it in Design Solutions Season 2 in April coming up. These are some of the last samples for that class. Basically, what simultaneous contrast says is that um, perception of color is relative. How we see colors um, depends entirely or a lot on what is next to it. So um, colors, especially that are complementary, have the, or across the color wheel from each other, have the ability to influence each other in fairly drastic ways. And so especially when you're using strong colors like these, um, they, the colors will influence, they will look different than they do um, separately. So this is why I wove little blocks by themselves because you'll be able to compare like, okay, so does this orange look the same here as it does up here? Does this green look the same in the block as it does when it's mixed? And um, in this case, I expect it not to look the same, but sometimes I'm fooled. This is why we sample because color is relative and actually that was my whole point of today. Um, we sample because, especially for color, I sample mostly only for color, sometimes for technique, but um, you don't necessarily or really know what's going to happen with colors unless you sample them. Because when you put them next to each other, they will influence each other and they will look differently than they do in the little ball or when they're by themselves. I just did a blog post last week about sampling. Um, a lot of it was about how I keep my dye samples, but the same thing is useful for weaving, keeping a record of what you wove, what yarns, samples of the yarns, um, maybe in 
image or a sample from the tapestry can be really useful in the future, at least if you like to use the same kinds of combinations again and help you learn. I also do these. I have these little, um, I do finger skeins. That I did a whole blog and I think I did a video about finger skeins. I know I did a video at some point, whether it was in an online class or on my YouTube channel, I'm not sure, but um, someone will remember. So I'll just start by making a finger skein of the mix. And then, um, so you can already see in the finger skein the difference in the blue-green between, let's see. No, it's not gonna focus because I turned off autofocus. The difference between the, the um, yellow-green in the yellow in the red orange and the yellow green in the violet or the blue whatever it is blue violet color is fascinating y'all really fun to play with this effect of course also happens with less saturated colors it's just that when you're doing a sample for a class that's going to be videoed where you can't see the colors in person, you're seeing them on a monitor um, or in a photograph, it's best to have them be really bright. But when you do this at home, you should do them with colors you would actually use. And often those aren't, the, the changes you might see in person might not be able to be photographed, which makes it hard for teaching. So that's part of why I use these really bright colors. But if you're in the class, you'll hear me say, um, and some of you here are in the class, try the colors you actually use. Try the bright ones first, play with it, and then try the colors you actually use. They will also be influenced, but if they are um, less saturated, the effects won't be quite as <laughs> intense. <laughs> um, So, <laughs> Janet says she just moved back to St. Louis from Boulder. Glad she's not shoveling. Yeah, but Missouri is not Colorado. I lived in Missouri for, for part of my life. It's a little known fact. When I was a very small child, six years in Missouri. Columbia. have this sneaking suspicion that this is getting wider. So another thing I often will do is measure, yep, it is very slightly wider than it was down here. Oh no, maybe it's not. Nope, oh, it's about the same. Okay. Um, measuring frequently is a great way to check yourself. So, Let's see. Would the solid colors look different if you didn't twist the orange green bundle? Not much, Paula. I don't think it's such a habit for me. There's no really reason for me to twist this solid bundle. It's just a habit. I'm twisting this one because I really do want these two colors to mix. Um, and if I didn't twist them, they would be much more linear. See how this is looking sort of patchy? That's what I. That's what I'm going for in this instance. But um, if if I didn't twist it, they would be much more streaky. There really is a big difference if you twist or don't twist. It's another fun sample to do if you use wet bundling. See what happens if you twist the bundles or don't twist the bundles. But as far as the solid color goes, I don't. It it wouldn't look any different if I didn't twist it. Kate, um, yeah, this, uh, yes, Kate, the, would making twists tell you how the simultaneous contrast bundle will look? Um, these, I think you mean, um, yeah, it gives you a really good idea. Um, however, this is a very small amount of color, and so I'm making a much bigger amount so you can actually see the effect. Little tiny bits of color um, end up doing that optical mixing thing instead of actually 
looking like a solid, like a, an area of a color. If there's just a little tiny bit, it's very hard to, if I were gonna use this in a piece and there was a larger area, I would certainly want to have experienced it in its larger form. The little twists won't really tell you what it's gonna look like in a tapestry. It's just not enough to start. However, it's better than nothing. I'm on a kick about sampling because people, many people resist sampling fiercely. And it is really a good practice. Yeah, the, it does start to look like a little bit of a twill effect, doesn't it, um, Leslie? I think that has um, probably something to do with the way that the twist is going. These are singles yarn, so I don't want to twist them the other way because it will make them act really strange. Although it would be a good experiment to try twisting it the wrong way, or you could make hand spun and do the twists the other way from the beginning to see how that changed the effect. That would be fun. Those of you who love sampling can go for that sort of thing. <laughs> Michelle says, um, yeah, so she's commenting about her daughter has a stuffed dragon that is jade green, but she swears it's blue. So there's a great example of how we all perceive color differently. Uh, some people are actually colorblind. They have their um, cones in their eyes don't perceive color the same way that the average of the rest of us do. I have one of the green and two of the orange, so there's only one of this side color. Uh, and also, if you've ever tried to photograph blue-violet, a lot of cameras don't pick up um, blues and violets very well. Also, have you ever just wondered whether people see things the same way you do? No way to know. There's no way to know. Oh, the joy of butterflies. When they get to the end, and they tangle. Kathleen asked if I always twist my multicolored bundle. Not always. Um, I once had a student in my studio. I think I wrote a blog post about this at some point. Many years ago, it was in Santa Fe. I had a student come for a week and um, she was working on a sunset and she was using um, my yarn, which is I think she was using my yarn. Anyway, she was using a yarn that maybe she hadn't used much in the past. And uh, she wanted this sunset to have a very horizontal, streaky, effective colors blending. She's working on color gradation and mixing colors. And um, she wove several inches of this thing with uh, twisting the colors the way I often do when I do gradations. And she hated it. She actually tore it all out and started over with the very same colors, but she didn't twist them. And the result was stunning. It was, it, she got that streaky effect um, that she wanted by not twisting the bundle. So it will look different. And of course it will look different depending on what yarn it is and how many strands you have and I could go on and on about the reason why you should sample <laughs> because uh, all of the variables contribute and make something different. So if you don't know what's going to happen, sample. So I don't always twist, but in general, um, if I'm going for a smoother gradation, if I want blending to happen, then I will twist them. 
on a big tapestry like the one behind me, when I do that, I will use my spinning wheel and ply. I will have laid out all the colors I want, what the mixes are, and I will just spend hours plying them all into little balls and then labeling them. And the spinning wheel makes a really nice even twist. So it'll look, you know, it'll look like a, a commercially spun strand of yarn like that. And of course this wants to widen where that join is. Constantly trying to keep that from pushing out there. Yeah, it could, thanks for you guys that are trying to remember where I talked about finger skeins. I do feel like I did a blog post about it, but I'll look it up and if I did, I'll put it in the um, notes for today. <laughs> I almost said the show notes. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. Oh, great question, Julie. She said, I may have missed this, but are you using Weaver's Bazaar and how many threads are in the bundles? I didn't say. Um, this is not Weaver's Bazaar. I was using some Weaver's Bazaar on this other sample uh, that I showed you first, but this is all um, Harrisville Designs Kohler Singles. It's a singles yarn and it only comes in undyed. And therefore I dyed all of this myself. And it's three strands. It's quite similar to the Swedish yarn Faro, F-A-R-O. If you're interested in a yarn that's similar to this, that's the commercial one I know of that's somewhat similar and um, comes in colors. Doesn't have a fantastic palette. Both of those yarns dye really nicely though. Kate, I have um, so much trouble with reds, so I could go on for an hour about dyeing oranges and reds. Kate says she just wrote to a yarn shop saying red color 968 is too orange for me and she wants a pure red. The shop owner wrote back and said there's no orange in color 968. So um, again, color is relative. So whatever their orange is, whatever the label is that they have for orange, um, it may well be that there's no orange in that color. I don't think that most dyers actually use orange, at least not if you're a primary dyer like I am. I don't use any orange dye in any of my yarns. This yarn was not created with any orange dye either. It, so her saying that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, Kate. Um, this yarn has a fair amount of magenta, which is a hot pink, and some yellow, because red and yellow make orange. Many of us dyers use a couple different primaries. So I use, um, for brighter colors, I use a red that is, you. if you saw it, you would say, oh, that's hot pink, a magenta. And, uh, then if I need a red that is not so cherry red, I will use, um, I might use a different dye that's more of a rusty red. A, so it would be like a warm versus a cool red. The hot pink red is cooler and the rusty red, like a maroon color is warmer. Anyway, that's an interesting comment, Kate. It's funny she said that. Um, yeah, everybody resists sampling, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. Uh, all right. Oh yeah, that's a great point too, Sally. Sometimes twisting um, gives you a more textural effect or it doesn't lay quite as flat. And that I found that that's true depending on the yarns. So these are singles yarns. So they twist really nicely because they are only one strand. Almost every 
yarn that's used for tapestry is at least a two ply already. So if you start trying to twist that, um, it's going to act a lot differently than it would um, than a singles yarn would because it's already plied once and now you're asking it to ply again. So you're basically making a cabled yarn, which when you twist it again, which is um, if you've ever bought a cabled knitting yarn, you'll notice it looks very different in texture than a yarn that's uh, just a two ply or a yarn where all the strands are plied once together. It could be a two ply or three ply or four ply. So yarn tips. Oops, let's see. How much of this do I need? Someday I'm going to do um, a whole series of things about yarn characteristics and all the things I've learned from spinning and dyeing and apply those to the tapestry yarns that you can get out there one day. Ah, Kate, interesting. So that's, yeah, the dyer um, or the yarn store earner said she just didn't see any orange and she did. And um, it's all perception. It's all about labels, what we call a color and how we perceive it. And how we describe stuff is difficult. So I do kind of push back against people who like to use labels, color labels, instead of numbers or the standard color wheel. Names like red, yellow, orange, blue, violet, blue, green, yellow, green. Those are our colors most of us can understand. This is a yellow, green. Um, when we start using color, you know, color names like chartreuse or, um, you know, dogwood or something like that. That doesn't, that, those descriptive words mean different things to different people. And I think it, we're getting, we're just making things muddier and muddier when we start to use, I mean, I do it too. I call, you know, a, a color like, um, you know, sky, whatever. I, I, um, yeah. It's just not as, as, it's not a common language in every, every dye house or every commercial yarn line has their own ideas of what I'm trying to get those. It will tend in a very narrow area. The warps will tend to pull together. So often I will pull them apart like that. So they stay nice and even. Also they'll, They'll try to spread out here at the where the join is and push in towards the center because they also want to spread out at the edge. So I'm trying to keep those warps, convince them to stay nice and evenly spaced. So often giving them a little tug like that is super helpful. Right there, that's a little bit narrower. That's weft tension. All right, well. I'm sure that I don't think I've screwed this up after that initial issue. So I'm sure you're all well and truly bored by the sample weaving here. Those of you in design solutions will see this in a few weeks, along with who knows how many other ideas. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, Oh yeah, Michelle has another good point. Serendipity sometimes happens that you don't know what's going to happen. And if you try something and it's not what you think is going to happen, but you might find something really cool. Like in this, um, here, I'll show you this. I go back to this sample. Uh, this, um, let's see if I can get that in focus. Uh, that the... Sorry, y'all. Hang on. Forgot that. Let me adjust this. No camera crew. I'm the camera crew too. The, um, I was using, this is Weaver's Bazaar, um, their grayscale, and I was really enjoying how um, mixing one gray with the black was really shifting how these lines looked. So that was um, a little bit of serendipity because I was only going to use black. And then I didn't like how strong that was against the really light colors. So 
this down here is actually, um, these first two lines are Harrisville Kohler Singles, which is what the background color is. And it looks really different. I don't know if you can see that, but the Weaver's Bazaar just looks really, um, just looks really different. Serendipity that I tried it just because I was like, well, I want to try black. I don't have any black Kohler yarn right here, so I'm going to try this Weaver's Bazaar. And then I really liked the way that it looked in terms of the different Um, the different shininess of the Weaver's Bazaar is a um, worsted spun, so it's very firm and shiny. It's the shiniest wool I've ever used, actually. Um, yeah, Jocelyn, great example. She says, our car color is tungsten. Give any idea, um, <laughs> any idea of what that color is? I have no idea what color your car is, Jocelyn. I'm going to guess it's like a deep yellow, but that would just be a guess because tungsten is the name I have for a particular kind of light bulb. Um, oh, cool. Suzanne says there's a neat article in Spinoff Winter 2021. Oh, I'm going to go dig that up, Suzanne, about structure and using different number of S and Z twist in the ply. So that's an interesting thing. I've never actually tried... Um, to alter the num you know, the way that I applied things together in terms of S and Z twists. So if you're a spinner, that probably makes some sense to you. Uh, why did I put the violet in the bottom? Oh, so Nan asked, why did I put the violet in the bottom? And I think she's asking about this. Pretty sure. Nan, you're asking why I put this color in here, right? Um, that is because that is the other combination I'm doing. So below here I did, I actually did three different color combinations. You can see here there's a teal and a violet and there was one more with this one and I'm just doing two. Um, it's just another variation and I wanted a block of this color to show so that one will show up up there. One thing I always forget with the Mirax. Um, you want to leave your shed in neutral and with the, uh, with the treadle, it's easy for me to just walk away. I usually remember when it's the little hook thing that, to unhook it, but with the treadle, it's easy to forget. So if you use a Merrick's loom or any other kind of tapestry loom that holds the shed open for you, make sure it's in neutral when you walk away. Uh, Barbara, that's great. We need to think of sampling as play instead of work. I agree. Um, oh, thanks, Marianne. I got a haircut. I know. Finally. Um, I waited a long time until it, I could find a time to go that was safe, and the numbers in our county have come down a lot, so I was finally able to get my haircut. Uh, first time in at least six months, which I'm sure those of you who have been in my class this spring have uh, noticed. Jocelyn, this was what I was waiting for. What is the color tungsten? She says it's a, a bit like a very pale gold. So my supposition that was some form of yellow, it sounds like might be right. Uh, so anyway, color names, whatever. Color is really fun no matter what. So keep sampling and um, yeah, I mean a color sample can just be like a little strip with all kinds of different colors that you're just trying out mixes. And sometimes people will put it, put a strip on their loom right next to what they're weaving to test samples or I sometimes on the um, Harrisville rug loom right there uh, in the, so it's a great big floor loom and in the sort of waist section before I start the tapestry, sometimes I will do some sampling. I don't do that a ton because I like to have the sample next to me as I'm weaving and if I do that on that loom in the waist and then it will get rolled up and I won't be able to see it anymore. But there have been times where I have used the, before I started the tapestry, I did some sampling. Anyway, lots of options. Or some people use just a little tiny loom like this, I use Merex looms a lot for the piece I'm going to weave, I will weave on that, that loom. But I'm sampling on a Merex, which means if I was sampling for the, the hand of the fabric, that would not be a good idea because 
the fabric won't feel the same on Americs as it will on the Harrisville Designs rug loom. Okay, thank you all. I'm rambling on now, so thank you for coming and joining me. I'll be back in two weeks on March 31st for our one-year anniversary of Change the Shed. Um, and I will uh, see you then. Keep weaving, and maybe weave some samples in the meantime. Let us know how it went. All right, y'all. Have a really great week.